Topic. You know that this is going on. This is one of three or four sessions this week that is touching on the topic of abortion. Um, and so we encourage you to, to go to all of them to learn more about um, exactly what's at stake right now. So I, as I said, I'm, I'm Jamie Navarra. I'm a professor of English here at St. Charles. Um, Anastasia Bierman is an instructor of English here at St. Charles as well. And Dr. Brenda Boudreau is a professor of English at McKendry University. And fun fact, she was mentor and still is to Annie and I. And so we're really glad to get to present with her um, on this topic. So relationships with, the, with your professors are, are lifelong lasting uh, educational events. So we hope that you enjoy this presentation. Um, what is a teach-in? So we want to start this off by talking about the fact that a teach-in is something that has been going on since the 60s. It started at the University of Michigan and was really an anti-war series of lectures and activism. It was organized and it was led by the faculty at University of Michigan and that first year they had over 3,000 participants. Um, so it, during that first teach-in it was a huge deal and then as the Vietnam War progressed there were many more teach-ins that popped up all over the country at colleges, universities, community colleges. Um, Democracy Days here at SCC really continues this tradition. It is a series of, of, of um, uh, discussions and lectures and calls for activism here in our very own community. So I think it's pretty cool that we're doing a whole week of teach-ins, really, and knowing the history of that. So some ground rules as we're talking about certainly what's a politically hot button issue. Um, no personal opinions about abortion today. This isn't exactly the forum for that. We are speaking in fact-based, science-based language, um, and our goal is to teach, not to inflame or, uh, or rile up. Our, our goal is to present um, educational information. So this means that we're going to be talking about actual legal cases and some of the ramifications that have come up, some of the potential issues for birth control, and then what the Supreme Court might do next, because that's on people's mind who care about reproductive justice, what, what comes next after uh, the fall of Roe v. Wade. We hope that you leave with some really great information. Uh, we want you to know how to dispel bad information. We want you to think about how to use language really mindfully. We are three English professors, so language is on our mind and how you use language is an important part um, of, of your activism. And then we want you to think about how you can make your voice heard no matter where you land on the spectrum here. So those are our ground rules. We're not going to get super personal and use lots of emotional language when it comes to this topic. Language, again, always an important thing. Uh, women and pregnant women, it's ingrained in our language. This is how people talk about pregnancy, though we know that people first language is usually a good practice. So calling someone by their condition first and then their identity second is usually not what we want to do. So we'll try to use people who are pregnant or people with periods because people who do not identify as women can still get pregnant and people who do not identify as women can certainly need access to reproductive care as well. So we will say women and pregnant person and people with periods sort of interchangeably during our conversation today. Some of the sources that we're using that I want you to be aware of that we're drawing from, these are good sources of information on this topic. The Guttmacher Institute, um, is a nonpartisan abortion research group. A lot of our information has come from them. They've been incredibly active uh, since Roe v. Wade, but especially in the last couple of years, they've been incredibly active with doing the research and putting together the information um, in a way that's reliable, fact-based, and scientific. Uh, the New York Times is a good source of reporting for this as well. Their coverage of abortion over the last couple of years has been uh, intense. They cover it from many angles, economically, um, in many ways that people have our stakeholders in the abortion discussion. The Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services, we're giving sort of some history, but we're also delving into what's going on in the state that you live in right now, in Missouri. So using 
the State Department of Health is an important uh, piece of this puzzle as well. And then finally, advancing new standards in reproductive health is based at the University of California in San Francisco, um, and we'll be referring to that especially their turnaway study. So you will know what that is by the end of today's presentation. Okay. Dr. Brenda Boudreaux is going to uh, give a little section of this talk now. Okay, so I'm the tall one, so let's make sure this still works. Can everybody hear me? Okay, that's all right. Um, Okay, so what I'd like to start with, um, so there is a session on Wednesday that is going to be dealing more di directly with the history, so we're, we're going to kind of hit that things really fast, and then during the Q&A, if you have specific questions, you can certainly um, ask those. So uh, basically, uh, the, the Roe decision happened because of this Mississippi case, um, Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health, and um, the, the case was supposed to be looking at whether or not uh, an abortion ban at 15 weeks was, um, was constitutional, constitutionally legal. And essentially what happened in April of 2022, um, a, 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 the decision from the Supreme Court was leaked. Nobody, we still don't know exactly how it was leaked, but, um, and so people got wind of the fact that the Supreme Court was getting ready to overturn Roe v. Wade, which was not what the, the whole case was really about. So then on uh, June 24th, the final decision came down, um, and of course Roe v. Wade was overturned, and basically it was t the abortion was turned back to the states, and so um, Justice Alito, who, who wrote the decision, said that the decision had been in 1973, when Roe was decided, he said that it was egregiously wrong. Um, for the most part, uh, the, way that that would, the, the way that the decision was actually written, it focused on an originalist argument that was really looking at things, saying things like, you know, abortion is not men mentioned in the Constitution, so therefore we should not be deciding cases based on the Constitution. Okay, so um, these are just up on the screen. I'm not going to go over all of these, but I'm going to give you just like maybe a minute or two just to look at them. So these are some of the things that have already happened. Um, since the, the uh, Roe decision happened on June 24th. So, like I said, I, I think I'll just let you look at them for a minute or so. And most of the states that are um, listed here are considered hostile states. So many states, when the Roe decision came down, um, had, had what's called a trigger ban. So immediately upon Roe being overturned by the Supreme Court, Abortion was completely banned in states, including Missouri, um, and uh, and then you, we've, we've sort of had a, a rolling um, a ro rolling decisions happening from states overturning uh, the right to an abortion. Okay, and I'm going to talk more about some of these a little bit more explicitly. Okay, I think it's important to know who the typical abortion patient is, and a couple of things up here I think are really important to consider, and one is that many, many abortion pe uh, people who get abortions are already mothers. Um, typically speaking, uh, Annie will show you some statistics in a little bit here, that most of the, uh, the majority of people who get abortions are low income, and then the other thing I think that's important to consider is that one in four women will have an abortion before the age of 45. That has been historically true in the United States. Okay. Um, another thing to consider, like this has become a political flashpoint on so many levels. And so, I mean, it's been, it's been um, something that really has created lots of havoc at the state level. Um, there have been lots of decisions happening, taken to the Supreme Court over, since 1973. Um, you can see that people who are Democrats tend to fall more on the pro-choice side, and you can also see that women, particularly ages 18 to 49, are also heavily on the pro-choice side as well. Okay. All right. Um, I also think this statistic is an interesting one to take a look at. Um, so if I had put up a, a slide that said, how do different religions actually think about abortion, it would, these statistics would look very different. And I think on Thursday, you actually have um, some one that's actually really focusing on abortion and religion. So I hope people will actually come out for that. Um, okay. Okay. Um, this is also, I think, really important to consider when you're talking about abortion because the, um, sometimes when people talk, use language to talk about abortion, we hear things like late-term abortion. 
uh, partial birth abortion. We're going to talk more about language in a little bit. But in fact, something like 95% of abortions um, happen during the first trimester. And 65% of those abortions happen within the first eight weeks of a pregnancy. Um, and we'll come back to sort of considering when people just do have later abortions, why that might actually be the case. Okay, this map shows you, so this, the blue states are the ones in which abortion is still legal. Um, most of these states have actually passed legislation protecting abortion in many different ways. Um, so, so things like in Connecticut have passed l laws that say that if uh, someone from another state comes there, the doctors who perform the abortions cannot be tried in other states. Um, I think this, looking at this, so I'm from Illinois, the one sort of right in the center there. Um, and the problem with people having to travel for abortions is that oftentimes by the time someone realizes they're pregnant, right, that's typically around six weeks, sometimes a little bit later, then they have to come up with the money to actually travel to another state. And every, every week of a, a pregnancy, it gets more and more expensive to have an abortion. Um, for many people, if you're coming from Texas, for example, East Texas, um, the average driving distance is something like 542 miles, and that's an increase of 3,017% uh, 3, um, distance that somebody might have to travel to get an abortion. All right, so uh, I have Illinois up here, and again, I'm from Illinois. Uh, the, there's a Planned Parenthood, which is directly across the river from Missouri, from St. Louis, uh, and it's in Fairview Heights. And this was something the Planned Parenthood in St. Louis actually knew this was probably going to happen, and so they started planning for this uh, well before the road decision actually happened. Um, and so now, because abortion is completely illegal in Missouri, people are actually going across the river to Fairview Heights to get an abortion. You can see that many clinics are clustered up in the Chicago area, and if you look at the southern part of the state, like, well, you can, you can see it, um, in Carbondale, they're actually building another Planned Parenthood, which will probably be up and running within the year, and essentially what happened was the clinic in Mississippi that was part of the Dobbs decision closed down and decided to move ac across the river. Um, so this is kind of what, ha what has happened since abortion was turned back to the states. So in some states, like Missouri, it's just completely banned. There's no, nobody's really talking about what's going to happen next. In some states, there are actually referendums on uh, you know, ballot measures. So these are, there's five states that actually have um, abortion as an issue on their ballot. And Kansas was one of the first ones to actually do this. So the Kansas referendum... Um, something like 900,000 people turned out for that election. It was um, a, a pri primary election. It was the biggest turnout ever. And even though the, 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 the ballot, the actual question, was written in a very strange way. So if you voted um, against the amendment, you were voting not to ban abortion. So there was lots and lots of things happening behind the scenes. People were calling voters and trying to confuse them. But um, over 60% of the voters in Kansas did overturn the amendment, and so abortion for now is legal in Kansas. Okay. So let's talk Missouri. So what's happening here? As you can see, here are some um, images from some of the parades that have happened over the last few years. All right, so these are the current Missouri abortion laws. Um, so this is from Fine Law. And so this is a little bit of a lawyer putting in some words of their own to kind of help out. But this is Missouri Revised Statutes, so Title 12, Section 188.017. And feel free to look this up online. This is the actual Missouri laws. And so the act of, or of using or prescribing any instrument, device, medicine, drug, or any other means or substance with intent to destroy the life of an embryo or fetus in his or her mother's womb, or we have the intentional termination of a pregnancy of a mother um, or prescribing instrument, et cetera, et cetera. And then probability of a live birth and all of that. And so the kind of illegal parts here, um, no abortion except in medical emergencies, and then you have this reasonable medical judgment, which is the kind of the big contention in the state of Missouri. What is that? 
Um, you say these three words, but what's a, med med a major medical emergency for anyone? Um, my version of it might be different from yours. What's life threatening? How long? You know, all of that. So I have actually have a few emotes on that. But it becomes a class B felony, which is everything from five to 15 years. So if you know your rules, right? Misdemeanor, felony. Felony is pretty, that's a pretty bad one. Um, and you can say, uh, let's see here. So I looked it up for the, uh, what is a medical emergency. So preserve the life of the pregnant woman whose life is endangered by a physical disorder, physical illness, physical injury, including a life endangering physical condition caused or by arising from the pregnancy itself or when continuation of the pregnancy will create a serious risk of substantial and irreversible, irreversible physical impairment of a major bodily function of the pregnant woman. Have you ever read law language? It's just wonderful. But as language connoisseurs like we are, it is very full of things because of course, just with anything, you can fight with words and you have to be able to put every little bit in there. So this is three pages of explaining what that actually means in the state of Missouri. And so everything from talking about any person, um, pregnant person, then you have the, um, the weeks, get to 20 weeks, not 20 weeks, and then you have, is the child viable, not viable? There's a lot of paperwork the doctor must fill out, the um, pregnant person must fill out, the facility in which the, or the abortion is being performed, they must fill out. If a, an abortion is needed for the medical emergency, the doctor, the hospital, the pregnant person, all will have to fill out certification, like documents, to then send to the state to make sure that it's all kind of on the up and up to make sure that no one gets in trouble or this is where they find out they are in trouble if something happened. Um, and so there is a whole lot more on this and there's lots of statutes. But the interesting thing about this one is that um, I think in a couple of slides it'll come up, but this has happened in 2017. So even when abortion was still completely legal in the United States, Missouri, the state of Missouri passed a law to make sure that if it ever did come back to the states, which it did, that they would be ready to go with theirs and this is what the trigger law is. And so this is what happened on June 28th. So all these things that happened. So a patient must receive state directed counseling that includes information designed to discourage the patient um, from having an abortion and then wait 72 hours, which means two days or two separate trips to the facility are going to have to happen. So in a case for someone traveling, that's especially to a different state. Illinois is not too bad, but they are very busy. So they have to go to a different state so that could be, so 72 hours, so four days, let's say travel days, about six days to, to have this thing happen, right? That's a lot of days off work um, for any person. Private insurance, there's some issues with private insurance. There's some issues with ACA, the Affordable Care Act. So if you're on any sort of government insurance, and as you uh, may know that every person is supposed to be on insurance of some sort, right, with the ACA passing. So there's differences, differences between private insurance, employer insurance, ACA insurance, all those different ones. Um, telemedicine is not allowed to happen here. And so during the, during the pandemic, if this would have happened, um, you would have had to go into a facility. And so kind of the, the risks with kind of all of the COVID and still COVID, right? Um, parent of a minor must consent, which is pretty typical of a lot of states. Um, public funding is only available in cases of life endangerment, rape, or incest. Um, banned in cases of life endangerment when the patient's health is severely compromised. Again, that's severely, how severely is severe. Um, the state prohibits abortions for the purpose of race or sex selection or in response to a genetic anomaly. So the genetic anomaly part um, might be everything from like hypoplastic left lung syndrome, right? So the kind of really big conditions. Um, I will tell you the only reason I know that term is from Grey's Anatomy. So if you've ever watched any Grey's Anatomy or any medical show, you have all the neonatal stuff. And so you see sometimes when they have to make a very serious decision. So this is kind of where all it is, but seriously, I don't know how many times they use that condition on that show. And then the state requires abortion clinics to meet unnecessary and burdensome standards related to their physical plant, equipment, and staffing. This is why the, is it Columbia, Missouri? Uh, Columbia, Missouri's uh, license ran out and they weren't able to renew it. And so that's why there is no longer an abortion clinic in the middle of Missouri. And so that ran out. And so then of course everything happened, but St. Louis can't do it either. So post-Dobbs, Missouri. So its preference is to ban abortion to the fullest extent of the law. Um, and it says, defend the right to life of all humans, born and unborn, declare that the state and all of its political subdivisions are a sanctuary of life that protects pregnant women and their unborn children, and regulate abortion to the full extent permitted by the Constitution of the United States, decisions of the United States Supreme Court, and federal statutes. 
And so here is what happens. So the thing that I read you about the medical stuff, that was the trigger ban that came into place in 2017. And so these are all the things that kind of help it happen. So retains gestational bans at eight weeks. Um, you've seen a lot of maybe like the six week rules and such. Um, life, life begins at conception. That's also another kind of um, thing that some states are defining. When does life start? Um, so you have the kind of the um, other sorts of procedures here. Let's see here. Undergo a mandatory the 72 hour waiting period. Offered an ultrasound a prohibition, uh, prohibitions on public funding and private insurance, then the minor thing, um, and then kind of all these other sorts of things that are, yes. And then p providers are also can get into uh, pretty serious trouble if something like that happens as well. So this is from the Department of Health and Senior Services in the state of Missouri. So if you, I know it's kind of small here, but the questions are, does DHSS determine whether termination of a pregnancy is conducted legal or, legally or illegally? And you'll say that says no. Can DHSS provide legal advice so that medical professionals and patients can know what is and is not legal? No. Of course, they would, they're farming it to the Missouri um, law. And so understandably, they don't want the kind of liability. We are not giving you medical advice. We give you, or we do not give you legal advice. We give you medical advice. So they are making sure that kind of the separation of the kind of words here. The medical emergency part is what the parts that I kind of um, underlined because that is such a serious issue in Missouri. That's really not defined. And for a, I read you that first little bit that was very, very language heavy. For them to have all of that legal language and then just kind of vague, vague book like the medical emergency part, that's kind of a, they're trying to ask for wiggle room. They want that wiggle room because of course that's for anything. Um, and a lot of times that's why you see any sort of legal contract, there is wiggle room. And that's why people have loopholes and all of those sorts of things, right? Get those prenups. So other things. So we have reproduct reproductive justice is bigger than abortion. And they're not the same thing. And I think that's something very important for us to all to remember. It's the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. As a, um, reported from Sister Song, Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective, which is a really cool site um, and movement. And then, so it's more expansive and intersectional and explicitly examines the systemic obstacles that make it hard for some people to control their own bodily autonomy and get access to basic reproductive health, which is everything from contraception, sex education, STI prevention, alternative birth options, prenatal pregnancy care, among others. And so Planned Parenthood is not just a place to get abortion care, of course. So if you've ever find yourself without insurance and all of that, you can get basic, the basic well woman's exam that you do yearly. Um, without insurance, it's very expensive, of course. Um, and being, I, say, I would say, a poor grad student, um, in my own experience, it's, it's very hard to kind of get your medical care when you're worrying about what Shakespeare played to write about next, to be honest. It's very silly wants and needs, but you have these opportunities, and so it's, all right, getting too bogged down personally here. All right, so abortion rates continue to vary by race and ethnicity. So you'll see um, the red is black, non-Hispanic. The blue, the light, kind of like tealish blue is Hispanic. The darker bluish purple, other non-Hispanic. And then the white is white, non-Hispanic. So this is up until around 2014, so 2000 to 2014. So you can see the kind of decrease in number from 2000 to 2014. And this is also from the Guttmacher. So the non-partisan, um, abortion um, institute is showing kind of how many women between 10, um, 15 and 44 get an abortion. Um, so you can see that it's not all that many for as much, no offense, to do to, about, about abortion. Um, but in terms of certain issues, and I know it is a hot button issue, it's something that very, people feel very passionately about, of course. Um, but the, the numbers are surprising, how many actually get an abortion throughout the country versus how many people are in prison for marijuana, let's just say, for instance. I know it's not the same, please do not. You can, you can uh, come at me in the question and answer if you'd like. So, unintended pregnancy and race. So we have this kind of uh, statistic linked back to access to sex education and birth control, i.e. Mississippi. So we see this 63% um, African American versus the 33 unintended pregnancies ending in birth. Um, and you can kind of see the, dis um, the disparities here. So unintended versus the ones that are also unintended but end up in birth. 
Abortion patients are disproportionately poor and low income. Uh, Brenda talked about this for spe uh, specifically. So you can see the kind of percentage of people is 75% there um, below the federal poverty line. Um, what is the federal poverty line now? I did not look that up. What is it? 30,000? 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. Yeah. Um, so you don't, you're not able to make that much a year at, in that level. And I think that's like a family of four with $33,000 a year. Um, so only a little bit or above that. So if you've ever seen some of the movies that you've seen recently about abortion, um, I think one out of a few of those would be falling under this uh, poverty level one. Um, so that movie with Haley Lou Richardson, Unpregnant, is based in Missouri. I don't know if you saw that. Um, but she was kind of a well, um, her family was well off, right? She didn't ask for help from her parents um, or anything like that. So they did the whole kind of journey. It's an interesting film, sort of funny. Um, but it's, she is not the target audience. Many of the movies that have come out in the last five to 10 years, they're not the target audience. They are younger, they are college age or even high school age, and they aren't who's actually getting abortions in the real world. So that's that disparity between what is actually happening and what does pop culture show us. And so that's kind of, I think, where the hot button issue is. Because when you think of a person who's having an abortion, what age is in your head? Do you have an, like, is there anything that pops up to you right now? Like, right now, what is it? Mine's like 2021 20, is what I used to used to think about, right? You think college age, you think yourself in your college age, or you think high school. But that's, but why is it that way? Is it just because that's what we get from, from pop culture, from our environments, whatever it may be, or, um, why is that? And so that's another thing that, how can you the dispel information that Jamie will cover in just a bit? So thinking about the why. So those denied abortion struggled more to pay the bills. Um, this composite you see kind of turned away at the clinic allowed to have an abortion and then you have that predicted due date is kind of where um, you kind of Where it kind of gets rough, right? So you go down if they were allowed to have an abortion They were able to kind of pay bills and such but think about how much a baby costs um, Think about diapers alone I'm not even talking about daycare and if you want to work you have to have somewhere for your kid to go And so it just becomes a cycle you end up paying the daycare what you're making at work, so do you actually make anything at the end of the day? All this sort of thing. And so there's just a lot of factors going into having a child, of course. And that's everyone's personal decision. So this is when it gets kind of rough. So here's the turnaway study. Women denied abortion are more likely to experience serious complications from the end of pregnancy, including, a, including uh, eclampsia and death. More likely to stay tethered to abusive partners, because there's help and all of that. There's a lot of things going to that. More likely to suffer anxiety and loss of self-esteem in the short term after being denied abortion. Um, less likely to have aspirational life plans for the coming year. More likely to experience poor physical health for years after the pregnancy, including chronic pain and gestational hypertension. And the study also finds that being denied abortion has serious complications for the children born of unwanted pregnancy as well as for existing children in the family. So about 1,000 women at the time, they sought abortion. Some of them were too far along in their pregnancies to receive an abortion at the clinic, and they were turned away while others were just under the clinic's gestational limit. So right, they were just right under the wire. Hold on, I'm making, playing with PC when I have a Mac. Um, we followed the women for five years. This is the, um, the turnaway study they did and asked them about their physical, mental health, finances, family relationships, and career aspirations. All the difference in outcome for the two groups was the attributable to, attributable to whether they got the abortion they sought or not. And so that's where that kind of line where the pregnancy due date with the money Right? How much they can make and such. And so I am done for now. Okay, so I'm going to come back a little bit to kind of thinking about what happens after Dobbs. And I think it's also important just to follow what Annie uh, just was talking about is abortions have actually decreased steadily since 1973 when Roe was actually um, was passed. And um, Oh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, oh, and, and uh, we see a direct correlation in some states like Mississippi that are very poor, where usually it's the uh, sex education is not as good, right? Access to birth control is not as strong. And so, um, and also maternal mortality rates are usually really, really low in some of these states. And so states that are passing these really draconian abortion bans are also the states who are not supporting mothers after they have um, children. So I think that's an important thing to say. From my perspective, one of the things that most concerns me is the criminalization that is already happening. Um, 
And, and it, I think it's a social justice issue, right? And, and Annie was talking about that with um, reproductive justice. But so since 2006, you can see the difference in how many pr um, pregnancy losses have actually been criminalized. And um, something like 15 to 20 percent uh, of, of people, pregnant people, of women who will, will actually have a miscarriage. And we don't want a situation where women are afraid to go to the hospital for whatever reason, right? Maybe they drank a glass of wine the night before, right? I mean, that sounds like it's, it's really pushing things out. But we have situations already happening where someone maybe is struggling with drug addiction um, and, and starts having a miscarriage and um, decides not to go to the hospital, right? So that, that's definitely a concern. Um, I have four examples up here of just some things that have actually ha happened. Um, so, f and again, this is also racially uh, and class biased, right? So 52% of the pregnant women who were arrested um, were black and 71% were low income, right? Those statistics, I think, are pretty startling. So there's a few examples on the screen of just where we've seen like just some really crazy examples. So the one on the left, top left, is that's Marche Jones. And she actually got into, she was five months pregnant. She got into a fight at a bar, which she kind of caused. And then she, um, she had a, she was shot, shot in the stomach and she had a miscarriage. And then a jury in Alabama uh, charged her with manslaughter, right, for not actually putting herself out of harm's way, okay? It was, all four of these examples were later dismissed because right now there are no laws that actually criminal, criminalize miscarriages but that has not stopped these women from being arrested and thrown in jail, okay? Brittany Pula, she's in the lower right-hand corner. Um, she was jailed for a year and a half. Um, she, had, she had a miscarriage, and then she was sentenced to four years in a state prison. Eventually, it was, was uh, dismissed, but not until she had actually spent two years in prison. The one in the upper right-hand corner is Chelsea Becker, and she was from California. She was homeless, she was addicted to meth, she had been actually, she had had once a two-year-old son at the time, I believe, um, and she was eight months pregnant and she had a miscarriage. And um, she ended up, I think the bail was something like 2.5 million. She ended up spending two years in jail until she could, eventually it was dismissed, but during that time she actually lost custody of her son, um, and, uh, you know, her life was really uh, thrown upside down. Every single person on this slide had her picture, you know, right away published uh, through the Internet, right? And so now you can put in any of these uh, women's names, and this is what's going to come up, right? And so th this has really destroyed their lives in all kinds of ways. The one in the lower left-hand corner is probably the most recent and most famous. This is Lizelle Herrera. And uh, she was uh, arrested in Texas. This was after the Roe decision. And um, all, I think the, t the two, especially on the bottom, um, their health care providers actually called the police, right? And so that's another thing people are really concerned about is what happens if, you know, and, and, and again, they're not breaking any laws by not notifying the police, but a lot of people have been very confused by the Roe decision. And that's going to happen more and more, I think, in hostile states. Um, if someone gets arrested, and even if it, it's, again, overturned, they've, their lives have already been sort of destroyed um, by, the, by the publicity. Okay. Um, all right. We are also seeing a culture of surveillance. Many, many people are worried about what this is going to mean. Again, criminalizing miscarriages. Um, that I already gave you some examples. The loss of medical privacy, right? So when all of these cases happen, people say, well, what about HIPAA laws, right? My, that my doctor is supposed to protect my privacy. Uh, and that, if, if that stops happening, people are going to be afraid to go to the hospital, right? Um, might not completely trust their medical providers. Um, people are telling pregnant people, you know, d not to use apps like period trackers, right? Are these the kinds of things that people might use against you if you have a miscarriage uh, or, or if you do a self-managed abortion, right? So there was a, a young woman um, in Nebraska, right? So they actually got information from Facebook and she and her mother were, were both arrested. Um, and then finally, some people are predicting kind of this, this tracking, this AI stuff that might happen, right? And so like anything people put on their phone, text, things like that are being used against pregnant people. 
And even if someone, you know, has a legitimate miscarriage, right, did, did not actually, you know, do a self-managed abortion, if, if this is criminalized, people are going to be afraid. And that creates, I think, a really dangerous climate for pregnant people in general. Um, okay, so th this is what the other thing that I think that people are very worried about. And so this was the concurring opinion written by Clarence Thomas. And he uh, had said, right, in future cases, we should reconsider all of this court's substantive due process precedents, including Griswold, Lo Lawrence, and Obergefell. And just to let people know, so the, the, the Griswold one, right, this is what actually allowed uh, married people to use contraception, right? This was a, a really early decision. But again, what might that mean if this decision is actually overturned at the Supreme Court level? Um, the Lawrence decision was about sodomy. That was decided based on privacy. Um, and if this, again, gets overturned at a Supreme Court level, what might this mean? And then the last one, Obergefell, that's our most recent one, and that's same-sex marriage. And, and um, because this was actually put out there in the concurring opinion, people think this is only a matter of time before this is actually going to come before the Supreme Court. Um, all right, and then this is, from my perspective, this is why everyone should care, regardless of what your, your personal opinion about abortion is, right? So if we cr criminalize pregnancy and women in general, um, especially people who are marginalized either through race or class, um, that's going to be, be, I think, a horrible climate um, to actually live in, right? Doctors are already afraid to treat women who are miscarrying. And so they're coming into hospitals, they're sending them to another state to get treatment, right? Some pregnant people are saying, I'm not going to travel while I'm pregnant because I'm afraid of what happens if I end up, you know, having a miscarriage in Texas or, or having some kind of a problem. Um, uh, people being forced to carry non-viable babies to term, right? Most late-term abortions happen, it's, it's like 1% of later uh, abortions actually um, happen, and usually they're for, for fetal an anomalies, right? The baby is not, the, the, is not viable, uh, the fetus is not viable, and then, um, you know, do we want to force people to actually carry the fetus to term? Um, some states, it's not true in Missouri yet, but there are already states like Oklahoma who are not making any exceptions for rape and incest. Um, the 10-year-old who uh, was taken to, from Indiana to, to another, or the, the doctor who performed that abortion took a lot of heat for that, right? And they're not exactly sure. They think it was actually an uncle, um, a 26-year-old man who had impregnated that 10-year-old girl. Um, Things like ectopic pregnancies, and essentially that just means like the, the egg does not drop into the, through the fallopian tubes, right? And that is not a viable pregnancy. If it's not treated, people will uh, bleed to death and die, right? Um, and then finally, this whole thing about um, emergency contraception, IUDs, and birth control. And again, Clarence Thomas has kind of hinted at that, but already some states have tried to pass legislation uh, getting rid of IUDs. Because again, if you believe that... Uh, um, life happens at conception, essentially what an IUD does is stop an egg from actually dropping, right? Um, and that, that I, you know, things like IVF, which many, many, many people rely on to get pregnant, um, this, this is something that could, if, if we think of every egg as, uh, you know, a life, right? What happens to people who are trying to get pregnant using IVF? So um, again, I think these are all reasons for people, again, regardless of your opinion about abortion, I think they are reasons why we should care. So finally promising some information on what you can actually do, what is in your realm of, of possibilities here. So one thing, you're here, so thank you. You're already learning about the, the fact-based information here. So a big part of this is destigmatizing abortion through our language. It's a political bargaining chip, right? Lindsey Graham has, has come out in the last week and said 15 weeks across the country, ban, that's it, right? It's a political bargaining chip to get votes, to not get votes, et cetera. Um, abortion as a word, like using the word abortion is difficult in social media. It's flagged and taken down or reported as inappropriate language. So just as if I were to say, Annie, I'm going to hit you, that would be flagged as inappropriate. But it would also be flagged as inappropriate if I said, I'm giving a presentation on abortion today, right? That's kind of fascinating that the word itself is something that you're not supposed to see on social media because it's been flagged as such. Um, 
teachers within your own comfort zone, use language really mindfully whenever you're talking about this. Um, it comes up at weird times. People ask you weird questions, I promise. Um, lobby your legislators and vote, right? Go outside, register to vote. Make sure your voice is heard in some small way. And then always coming back to rely on fact-based scientific reports and studies, not just what you see in the newspaper or on social media, but really rely on facts. Um, dispelling misinformation is a big deal. Annie presented a little bit about the turnaway study. So when women are interviewed after they tried to access um, abortion care and then interviewed them again five years later, most of them report little to any regret. They say this was the right decision for me at the time. And that's a study of a thousand women um, through, the, through the Guttmacher Institute. Um, regret, in fact, is much higher when women have to put babies up for adoption. So that, which is often offered as an alternative, is severely damaging and traumatizing to, uh, to mental health. Um, so there's all kinds of misinformation out there that, that these are, um, these are uh, the things that are out there. Um, in fact, abortion is extremely safe. 95% uh, of the time, it's incredibly safe and effective. Um, it doesn't cause mental or physical health problems just by having the procedure. It's, it's, it's health care. Um, heartbeat bands are completely arbitrary. I don't know how many of you know pregnancy math, but six weeks means that you, so uh, four weeks means you missed your period. Right? So because they start two weeks before conception is how pregnancy math works. So when you miss your period, you're probably at four or five weeks already. And so six weeks means that your period is one or two weeks late. Um, that is almost impossible for a lot of people to know, especially if you have an irregular period, if you're a young person, um, if you are obese. There are reasons why your period may not turn up at the right time. And so people don't know they're pregnant at six weeks. Um, this is supposedly when the, the heartbeat ban um, it, it comes into, into effect. Um, so that's, a, that's problematic. A fetus does not have a heart. It is an electrical signal. That's, that's just that's the scientific facts of it. And then partial birth abortion is, is um, a complete misnomer. Abortion does not happen up to the point of birth. That is not a thing that is happening. Um, the cases of abortion that are later in pregnancy are happening because there's a real anomaly, there's a real danger to the fetus or the mother at this point. So partial birth, birth abortion is not, it's just loaded language. When we're looking at how language matters, this is uh, the part that I think is the most, the most important, is how we actually talk about this. Um, so here are some, some tips, some ideas, some things to maybe uh, that might stick with you, but how we talk about this. Choice implies um, consumerism. <laughs> Choice implies would you like this or this, right? It makes it seem frivolous. Decision implies that it's a carefully thought out uh, decision. It's a carefully thought out piece of health care. Um, the phrases reduce abortion or keep abortion rare um, those we should we should um, make sure that we're talking about making sure that abortion is safe and legal and reducing the rate of unintended pregnancy and that comes back to things like access to uh, birth control access to health information access to um, to information in that way baby versus embryo or fetus um, it is not a baby until it is born scientifically speaking it is an embryo until eight weeks and then after eight weeks, it is a fetus. And remember that two thirds of all abortions are happening before eight weeks. So it's really important to get those words right. Um, again, baby is a super loaded, when I think of baby, I think of like, you know, 10 toes and 10 fingers and sparkly eyes, right? Um, that's not what the case is, scientifically, medically speaking, at eight weeks, it's just not. Late term abortion, um, replace that with abortion later in pregnancy. Late-term abortion is a term that's created to uh, stigmatize abortion that happens later in pregnancy. If you're thinking about this, people who are having abortions later in pregnancy are absolutely devastated by what has happened, right? No one's waiting until 38 weeks to say, oh, I don't think I want this. It's a real medical emergency at that point. And so people in the medical field um, need to use that language more strongly, right? Um, uh, heartbreaking and tragic, making it a real personal decision. This is about 
people's individual uh, decision-making skills here. Um, and then finally, the, the heartbeat bill, which I mentioned earlier. So choice, again, chocolate or vanilla, <laughs> steak or fish, those are, those are choice words. So avoiding that kind of a language, which has been historically used, um, can be an important part of this. In Ireland, um, when the referendum, there was a referendum in Ireland in 2016, 2014, 15. Uh, just a few years ago, sorry, in Ireland, there was a referendum on the status of abortion in the country, um, and they used the phrases care, compassion, and change. They really didn't use the word abortion in the language for this referendum, but they used personal health care, health decisions here. Um, the phrase, everybody loves someone who has had or will need an abortion, is absolutely accurate going back to the statistic that one in four women will have an abortion before the age of 45. And an abortion in this case does not necessarily mean that that baby, that that fetus, that that, that life was unwanted or unintended, that abortion covers the health procedures for saving the life of the mother or the child as well. So you will know someone who is affected by this. Um, use a woman, not women as a whole. So make it personal, make it specific, make it a personal decision. Thinking about the way that we tell stories, again, destigmatizing this. If one in four women are having abortions, we need to be able to talk about it in a way that is not shameful and awful. And so there's uh, We Testify is a great testimonial account that you can find online. There's lots of good storytelling. Um, I'm going to give a quick plug and say a lot of musicians are writing about this and talking about it right now. Uh, and then finally, thinking of this as modern, thinking of this as progressive, thinking of this as caring, thinking of this as health care, not um, some of these extreme views that we've seen in the past. So for more information, definitely CDC, the WHO, the Guttmacher Institute, uh, state, health, state health departments, those are all really good sources of information. Um, remember, use scientific fact-based studies whenever you're looking at this stuff. Don't go to um, the sort of focus on the family, really coded language here. Look at fact-based information. So we welcome your questions and hope, uh, hope that you have questions. We want to answer your questions. Please focus on facts. We're not talking about emotion and morality. That's not for here. Uh, there's a fantastic panel that's going on at, I think, 11.30 on Thursday that is about um, uh, sort of uh, an interfaith. Is it 10 o'clock or a That will be at 10 o'clock on Thursday. 10 o'clock on Thursday, there is an interfaith panel about uh, it's a discussion about abortion. So if you are interested in sort of the emotional, moral, religious uh, aspects of this, please, please, please go to that. There's another panel on this that is on Wednesday at 1.30, and some of our wonderful faculty in the social sciences will be talking about this from the perspective of history, sociology, and political science. So we're attacking this issue from all sides, and I hope that you are interested in those things. So. Michael will uh, run around Phil Donahue style. Yes, who has questions? <laughs> and we're we want to hear your talk. questions. Yes, sir. Can you describe the um, process of the like abortion after the baby is taken out, like of the mother's uterus? You mean how an abortion is actually done? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Uh, And, but just to be slightly more graphic, uh, when you have an abortion that's before eight weeks, it's like a heavy period. That's, it's not, uh, you, there, aren't, there aren't body parts, uh, which I know is sort of uh, this idea of their bags full of body parts being thrown in dumpsters. It's, you know, that's fabricated information. That's not how this, that's not the, the factual information on how this works. Have you ever seen like the, um, how big is your, Oh yeah, the the measuring cheese, your baby and right, like yeah. all the different variety, right? Everything gives up to like a squash. So there's watermelon. Yes, <laughs> all of those, and like there are various levels, right? And so if you look at what eight weeks, I don't know what the equivalency is for eight weeks. It's like a lentil. I'm yeah, serious. Like it's a, a lentil. Yeah. So it's a not lentil even. Is, <laughs> can't even. Maybe the tip. Maybe the tip of this, right? Maybe. Um, perhaps it's actually like that would be. It's like a, a grain of rice. Let's put it that way. Yeah. 
Can I also just say, so, so over 50% of abortions, um, especially since 2020 and with COVID, have been, are medi medication abortions. And so they can happen with two, two series of pills, um, mifepristone and misoprostol. So same kind of thing, it's, it's like a heavy period. But very much, we are not medical professionals, <laughs> right? So we are English professors with masters and PhDs in English literature and gender studies and all of this. We have taken lots of classes. We have talked about this issue, but please, please go for your medical advice from our trained medical yeah. professionals. Yes, of course. <laughs> and so we do not want to make it sound like we are medical professionals in any way, shape, or form. We just uh, study this issue a bit. So please look up more information, especially if you have want more specifics on the podcast or any other website. <laughs> Okay, that's a good question. Who else has got a good question? Highly informative session, by the way, and I hope we're not done. I'd like questions from so the people. Up in the front. Here we go. I have a couple of questions. You can probably hear me. I yes. Um, one of my <laughs> questions is, is the morning after pill included in the language? And I know you're not legal to it either. The morning after pill is included in the language that is forbidden because it's in medicine, whatever it says. Yes, for okay. so 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 the conversation. So the morning after pill is no longer sold. Um, I think you can still Amazon it, right? Like it's one of those things where it still hasn't been completely eradicated in a way, but there have been some rumors and mills, and so again, this is a rumor, right. that they could perhaps track your Amazon or track that you're getting it in the sure. mail. And well, of course they can track yeah, it. Right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And that you, you can ask me to buy it again all yes. the time. And so exactly. you can be in trouble for it. So it's one of those things where like, you know when COVID tests were hard to get, right? Right, especially where you were, and you can only get so many from your house, right? There's like four per house, so like you do this thing where, ooh, I have a friend in North Dakota. I'm serious. This is what happened. A friend in no, Montana. I, my roommate's friends in Montana. They can get more tests in Montana than we can get in Missouri in the St. Louis area. So what happened was this friend bought them in Montana and then mailed it to us in Missouri, so we could have a couple extra. She's talking about COVID tests. Yes, but COVID tests, of course. Yes. Make, but the, like, it the was comparison a whole is thing. Or like, you know, you call and like, hey, does, does anyone have a COVID test? Or I remember specifically out in the Pacific, there were a lot more COVID tests in the Pacific, Missouri, where she uh, lives, as opposed to like in the city of St. Louis where I live, just because there's a whole lot more people. Um, and so it's one of those things where it hasn't quite caught up with all along, but that is something that is being looked at, especially emergency contraceptive or anything, even like, not condoms, but I would say like the IUDs and like the medical IUDs, um, patches. Um, those patches, rings, patches, shots, rings. right? Yes. Those are all given by your medical professional. And then such sites as like NERCs, N-U-R-X, mm -hmm. right? So those are the places where I keep, like, you know, as, as a woman of a certain age, you get ads for certain things on Facebook, Instagram, <laughs> all of right? Like anything reproductive wise. And so they'll say like, oh, you can get your birth control over the phone or online, all this. I'm like, well, it's not gonna be certain states anymore that I would not be able to get it, if I, even if I wanted it. So would we start doing the weird illegal thing where do I go to Illinois to get it? Do I have, you know, have my mom buy it in Illinois so then I can cross the river? But then that's the whole thing with the crossing the river thing. Right. And, and my friends mentioned that. Um, and that if you are traveling from, what is it? Give me a state, Texas. How many states you have to cross? It's like across five states or something. Yeah, and so it could be that you go start at Texas, and you may have to go around to avoid certain states to get to like even Illinois, and a different way to kind of get around it. So you are not caught in the state that has some sort of rule like, ma'am, are you going to get an abortion? Because you have to have to answer honestly, right? And like you can get in trouble. And that's what happened. Isn't that what happened with Facebook? The mother, daughter, minor, like they got in trouble in a state because they were on their way. Sure. 
doctor, the doctor. So that basically means that they don't know that he's going to approve that. Yeah, and so that's where the yeah. memory I'm is, right? I'm just saying, so, that's true. So, and then depending on the, depending on the hospital system, right? So if we think right. about how many of our hospital systems in the area are related to religion in some way, right? right. All we have Barnes Jewish, St. Mary's, St. Luke's, like, Exactly, so they're all kind of religious, so they have religious rules, and they, of course, as a medical institution, have a medical system. They are allowed that, right? Like HSHS is like Hospital Sisters, something or another in uh, Illinois, I grew up in Illinois as well. Um, but there's, it's all, you know, saints and everything, and this area is very- Well, the time yeah. frame, it's not just exactly. that, it's a time Yeah, frame. and so it could be like, let's say you go in on Thursday, like a person goes in on Thursday, you know, how some things work when you are needed Let's say the government, let's just, it uh, is the government. <laughs> so it's, uh, oh, we can't, you know, Friday we're not going to look at it, so let's wait till the next Monday. Oh, Monday's a holiday, and so let's wait till Tuesday. Tuesday, maybe somebody looks at, oh, gotta go to my supervisor, so then to my supervisor, then to their supervisor. And so after that, how, many, how long will that take to get anything done? Um, if you've ever had to do with any sort of bureaucracy, aka the DMV, um, you know some things take a while. And so it could be one of those things that times out magically that it very easily Yes, but then at any, at any point they can be like, no, and you are out of luck. And, and then that's concerning when there's a medical issue that you gave to the doctor. Yes, and so kind of like the 20 weeks versus the non 20 weeks, and they have to determine. And every, because it's so kind of the wiggle room area, like I said, so the, a medical condition here that is dangerous, oh my gosh, this is going to be fairly bad, we need to make sure we do something, versus here at a different hospital system, they can be like, no, you're good. And they have the economy to do that. Just like a pharmacist right now can say, I don't want to sell you the birth control pill because they don't have to, right? The morality was all along there. And that's kind of true everywhere. That a person at Target can deny you that because they personally feel like you should not have to. Um, or anything. Or you look young. Or they don't have to actually tell you what it is. They just say that I am taking my medical right or my right to not sell you this prescription. And, and that's what happens with microcostal in particular. So right. that's actually And they could get in trouble too, and that's the thing, right? Can the entire CPS who is servicing an area that has no, like, no other pharmacy in the area, if they get in trouble for giving this birth control pill, they can't give insulin, they can't give any other medicine that's gonna be very medical necessary for, if you think about like food deserts, places where you cannot get food. A, a, far, pharmacy, a CPS pharmacy in a Schnucks is a lifesaver for a lot of families, especially in rural areas. And so can they risk getting in trouble for this one abortion pill to then prevent thousands of people from getting any types of other medical care. Then that's gonna be a decision that the CVS has to make or the individual manager, or even it could be from the big CVS, be like, no, we can't do this because they don't wanna do it for liability, legalities, all that money, honestly, right? Time, money, legal stuff. And so it's, it's such a complicated issue. And is there a way that, like there have been to do with recreational marijuana, is there a way that it can be on a ballot well, they are with five other states are doing this, okay, yes. That's exactly how they're doing that. Right, yeah. right. So the right, the five other states have it on, on as ballot initiatives right now, and then Kansas, we saw, already passed that. So, um, yeah, if it's going to be turned back to states' rights, theoretically, that's what's up next. Yeah. Kansas kind of surprised us. Everybody surprised you. <laughs> Any other questions? Here I come. We want to hear you. And if you could bring the microphone a little closer to you. So you mentioned a uh, like proposed national ban by Lindsey Graham. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, are there any other like legal basis on a national level that can protect abortion rights? Uh, that's a, that is a really good question. So, so there's something called the wi Women's Health um, the Violence Against Women Act. No, it's no, it the women, it's the Women's Health Initiative, and it didn't. It actually passed the House, but didn't pass the Senate. So it's gone up maybe three times. And some people think if that was passed, that they could actually put abortion language in in there. I think it's so heavily politicized, though. I think it'd be really difficult to get something. Um, through legislative channels at this point. 
But technically it's one thing that could be an amendment, right? And so then it can never be kind of messed with in the same way. But because we've relied, I guess, the government, the uh, Americans have relied on Supreme Court decisions, like you have the Ober Obergefell, right? So like um, we have the anti like sodomy laws, we have gay marriage, we have um, even same, uh, um, interracial marriage, right? Which is one that Clarence Thomas, who has, ha who has an interracial marriage, did not mention, is that this was Loving versus Virginia, yeah. Yeah. right? And so that's one of those rules that was ruled by a Supreme Court, is that his marriage would not be legal if that Supreme Court decision had not gone through. And so it can be overturned just like any of the other ones. But of course, I personally think my hmm, Clarence Thomas didn't pick that one, did he? He was talking about marriages. Um, but that's one of those things where the Supreme Court decision, they're always kind of on the precipice that they could be overturned. So just like Board versus um, Brown versus Board of Education, right? Um, this was just the law for any person go to school, right? This is where little Ruby, what's her class name? Bridges. Bridges, um, going to school. And you have lots of these Supreme Court decisions or the, the um, thinking about any of the freedom of speech things where you can um, prayer in school, no prayer in school. Uh, everything from the girl who got in trouble on Snapchat for she got her accepted or she um, brandy something. I can't remember how. It's a dangerous precedent for the yes. Supreme Court to just start overturning their own decisions. Overturning, or then, then like, so somebody can come back with a different decision. So like this girl who got in trouble for saying something on Snapchat about her school, which was off school ground. So seriously, she said like, F something, right? A few different F bombs kind of throughout her little sto uh, face or Snapchat story. And the Supreme Court said that she was allowed to do it. And her parents said, we shall punish our child, you should not punish our child. Which is fair, right? A parent should punish their child. She got kicked off the cheerleading squad for a year, had a lot of ramifications. She had to wait five years after high school to have this decision heard. But then next year they could come back and be like, actually, anything you say, even though you are a student, so think about where you are. You are students at SEC. And if you have that anywhere on your social media, or because I know that you're a student at SEC, and you say something offensive about SEC or anything around campus, you could be expelled, right? And so that's a decision that could be, and is that fair? Same thing with your job. Is it fair if you say you're, you're 21 and holding a beer can, but let's say your job has a no tolerance against alcohol? Like, is that fair for you to get in trouble for it? It's not, right? It's your own personal social media account. And so thinking about all these things and that, is that, it's that precipice. But back to that point, right? There's lots of different ways, but there's always lots of different loopholes to get out of those things, which is what, this, what Roe v. Wade was on. It was always kind of a on the tip of the iceberg kind of thing, in one way or another. Many people feel like the government has not done enough. I, I don't think anybody actually expected the Supreme Court to overturn its decisions. That was very rare to, to uh, uh, stare, dis, stare decisis. And basically, the, the Supreme Court has always said if, if a law is in place and people rely on it the way that women have done over the years, relying on it, assuming that abortion would be legal, it was, it was really surprising to people that they overturned that particular law. Um, but you know we have things in place like the Hyde Amendment that was passed by an Illinois governor back in the early 70s that say that women cannot use um, Medicaid to get an abortion, right? That's a law that has been brought up over and over and over and people just are like, oh, you know, we don't want to touch it. And I think that's kind of what has put us in the position we're in now. It's a little too little too late. Anyone else? Yes. Um, wasn't there some kind of like executive order that Joe Biden just did to like overturn what uh, the Supreme Court did, or what was that? that I, I think he's trying to pass again. I think it's that women's health thing where he's trying to really put. Um, strengthen the laws that allow like like so doctors would not. Um, let me, let me back up. Basically what that particular law said is that a doctor cannot be criminalized for making a decision to save a woman's life. And in fact, he, um, he, is op he or she is obligated to do so. Um, the problem is, is that I think there's still so much uncertainty among medical providers about, you know, the state laws are saying things like, if, if you um, help a, a person have an abortion, you can go to jail for 10 years and get a $100,000 fine and lose your license. But I think what Biden was trying to pass was at least trying to you know, say explicitly to medical professionals, like if, if a person's life is in danger, you have to provide health care. But the problem with executive orders is that every presidency, especially with the change, they can, day one, they can be like, I'm going to mix all these, you know, 25 that the last person did. 
and so this is what happens every single um, change in any pre uh, presidency is like oh we're going to put these back in we're going to take these out and so even with like pre president trump then to president biden and then it'll take like, another republican it's just keeps switching here and there it's not reliable no because every two or three years depending on what's passed and then they can wait so like if biden gets eight years yeah it's a few more years but then it's going to be back again and as we've seen you know last few times it's been kind of every four to eight years we have a new political party in charge and so that's also the problem so that's even more precarious than a supreme court decision mm -hmm. and so that's the kind of problem with relying on executive orders they can do like it's kind of like a band-aid on a get yeah, like a gushing wound. wound right like if you've heard that right like little things to help here and there so it helps somewhat it helps for now and this is what we're going to do but it's not a long-term permanent solution if especially if we're thinking about 50 years from now what is what's going to happen so, so a perfect example of that is mifepristone, which, which essentially is a, a stops pregnancy hormones. This is usually before you take misoprostol to cause um, an emptying of the uterus. So that was a drug that the FDA had decided you had to take it in the, the presence of a medical professional. The medical professional had to have that drug there in his or her office. And they realized during COVID that actually people can take those drugs, you know, complete, completely safe safe and without even having a, you know, a doctor present. Um, when, when President Trump got into office, that was one of the first things he did to say like, no, we're putting it back on that list that you, keep, you, know, you have to go to a doctor's office to, to have this, um, to take this initial pill. All right, excellent questions. And let's show our appreciation for this highly informative and important session of the abortion teaching. Thank you, Thank you all. This was really outstanding. And please take a look at the program. There are 15 more sessions today through Thursday. Lots of great stuff. And once again, voter registration right outside these doors.